But let's let's go to the breaking news right now. Tex MacGyver. I mean, this is a case we covered gavel to gavel here at the Law and Crime Network. It was a fascinating case, like all the cases that we have. Uh, in this particular instance, in Tex MacGyver's defense, Nemo, was that he was in the backseat of the car. He got startled when he had a gun in his hand because he was worried about Black Lives Matter protests in Antifa and that the uh, weapon fired going through the front seat, striking and killing his wife. Uh, this occurred in September of 2016, case out there in Georgia. He was convicted of, now let, let's break this down, not malice murder. He was convicted of felony murder, which means that there was a felony during the course of a felony. Somebody dies. It carries the same kind of sentence. Uh, he got life in prison for this. Uh, but there was an argument that was being made at the time, and I remember all of us kind of talking about it, uh, that it seemed like an inconsistent verdict uh, in, in how they came about this. Uh, now, on top of that, the Georgia Supreme Court has reversed the conviction unanimously, arguing that the trial court made an error by not charging what we call a lesser included offense. And that lesser included offense would be misdemeanor involuntary murder. In essence, Nima, uh, I, I haven't read the decision yet, but usually what that means is that the court is saying it was legitimately in the case, and by not charging it, you gave the jurors too draconian a choice. If the facts were sufficient, you should have charged a lesser included offense, which would result in a substantially reduce sentence. Nima, this is a pet peeve of mine all the time here on the network. Uh, having been a prosecutor, having trained thousands of prosecutors, don't play the game with the jury charges. If it's in there, let it be in there and let the jury make the choice. Prosecutors don't want that because they want to put the jurors in that position of either the, uh, a high charge or a not guilty. They don't want the not guilty. They don't want that middle charge because it carries a lighter sentence. But it causes cases to be reversed, Nima. But Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's start with the felony murder uh, aspect of it. And we're seeing this a lot. Uh, not just in this case, but we saw with Derek Chauvin, right? Sometimes the prosecutors, you know, they have a tough time proving the <clears throat> intent for murder, that malice, right? So what do you do? You charge an underlying felony, and in the George Floyd murder case, that was also an assault, right? Much easier to prove an assault than an intent to commit an assault than an intent to kill, and then you sort of get around some of the uh, intent requirements for murder. So that's a trend that we're seeing recently, not just in this case, but other homicide cases throughout the country. But I agree with you, Bob. You know, as a prosecutor, when you get that compromised verdict, that lesser included, the jurors split the baby, that's considered a loss, right? You don't want to get a manslaughter, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, when you think it's a murder. But when that's the defense theory of the case, we're seeing it right now here in LA, the Nipsey Hustle murder trial, um, same thing, the defense is arguing for a lesser included. You got to let the defense argue that. You got to let that go to the jury because otherwise you're going to deal with what we're seeing here reversible error the georgia supreme court for the second time really in a matter of weeks is overturning a murder charge and sending the case back for a retrial all because the prosecution got a little too greedy here bob yeah and, and I've, i my philosophy always was not that my philosophy is necessarily right but a win is a win through the appellate system so that the conviction is sustained because you don't do yourself any good we all know the physics of a trial is that when you have to do a retrial, there's transcripts now. It gives the defense more of an opportunity to be able to cross-examine witnesses. And it doesn't do the victim's family, or the public for that matter, any good by having to retry these cases. Nima, I, I think you're right. <clears throat> there seems to be a trend of prosecutors kind of flouting, if you will, these things to get the win, quote-unquote, only to have it reversed down the road. Yeah, you're pushing it too far, you know, when it really kind of a questionable area and again you're really depriving the defense of their defense this is their argument this is their theory of the case so when you successfully argue and you convince a trial judge that they're going to exclude whether it's evidence or a jury instruction or something and if you're just creating an automatic appellate issue mm -hmm. why do it you got a strong case you know you got your motive just put it in front of a jury and let them make the right decision. All right, let's talk felony murder for just one quick sec a second about that. As a homicide prosecutor, felony murder, felony murder, felony murder. I love felony murder. It was the ace card in my pocket. To your point, and I'd like you to expound upon that so that our audience understands, usually the in New Jersey it would be knowingly and purposeful, some call it actual malice or deliberate, but you're talking about states of mind there, and it can become very difficult uh, to prove what somebody's state of mind is. 
is. But that felony murder ace card's there, so that if you can prove an underlying felony and somebody dies during the commission of that felony, at least in my state, and I believe here in Georgia as well, the sentence the jurors don't realize is just as harsh as if it was an actual murder case that was proven knowingly and purposefully. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's good old common law murder or second degree murder, right? Sometimes as a prosecutor, there's different levels of intent for homicide. You got the premeditated, and I'm talking about here in California, right? That's going to be the first degree. Then you have second degree. You knowingly committed the act. You pulled the trigger or whatever the case may be, or you committed an underlying felony, and as a result, a death ensued, right? The common example is, you know, you're robbing a bank and, you know, co-conspirator, there's a shootout, someone dies. I mean, you're engaging in a dangerous activity that you should, as a criminal defendant, be criminally liable for any death that ensues. That's felony murder. And then obviously you got your negligent homicides and voluntary manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter here in California. So, you know, what prosecutors sometimes don't want to do is they don't want to prove that malice, that intent to actually kill someone or inflict substantial bodily injury. So they go with these assaults, which are still felonies, right? And again, that this is what the state of Minnesota successfully did in the Chauvin case. They didn't want to have to convince the jurors that Derek Chauvin intended to kill George Floyd or acted in a um, manner that was likely going to result in his death. They just said, well, you know, Derek Chauvin just wanted to assault George Floyd. And as a result, a death ensued. So it's a much easier path to getting a second degree homicide conviction because you only got to prove the intent to commit the assault not the intent to commit homicide. Well, for all of our wannabe or uh, prosecutors that watch our show, and we know a lot of lawyers do, that felony murder is the ace card, like I said, uh, but a rebuke, a substantial rebuke uh, by the Supreme Court in the Tex MacGyver case thoroughly trashing, basically, the idea that he should there should have been lesser-included offenses, so he will be retried.